Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait a moment or two to make sure everybody that needs to can make it into our room here. In the meantime, if anybody would like to use our chat box to introduce yourselves or to say good evening, that would be great. Love to know who's here. I see some familiar names, but always nice to meet some new folks. Well, as you all continue to introduce yourselves, we're gonna go ahead and get started with this evening. I still see a few more people are joining us, but I'm so thrilled that, that so many of you are here to join us tonight. So good evening, everyone. And again, thank you for joining us for CCAHA's first ever virtual open house. I am Laura Hort Stanton, the Executive Director of the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. And normally at this time of year, we would be having a wonderful in-person open house at our lab space in Philadelphia. And during that time, we would be showcasing to you all of the wonderful work that we do in conservation of book, paper, photographic materials, as well as our housing and framing, our outreach services, our preservation services, um, and just everything else that, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And unfortunately, as you all know, COVID-19 has made that impossible for us to do this year. And so while I miss having all of us visit in person, we're excited to have you join us in this new format. And as I was saying to my fellow panelists before we got on, I am happy that for the first time in 15 years, this is an open house I can do in my slippers. So it's a fun treat for me in that way. So tonight we're going to be showcasing on this inaugural evening of our open house, three objects, each with their own really interesting story that I think that you'll appreciate. But before we get to these interesting pieces, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. I know at this point in pandemic, almost everyone has some familiarity with the Zoom platform that we're using. However, Zoom uh, webinars is just slightly different. Um, so just wanted to point out a few things. First, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see several functions that are there for you. The first, which everybody I see you're using so well, is the chat function. Use this space to continue to introduce yourselves for casual conversation throughout the presentations or to reach out to us if you are having any tech issues um, and someone from our team will be able to help you out with the technical part. You'll see another function here that's labeled Q&A. Please use this function to submit any questions you might have for tonight's speakers. Um, any questions you'll be, you put in there, we're going to use for our moderated panel discussion at the end of our time. Lastly, at the top right of your screen, you'll see options for either gallery view or speaker view. And my suggestion is that you set this to speaker view so that you can better see whoever is speaking at any one point. So with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to turn things over to CCHA board chair, Larry Massaro, to also welcome you and to thank our generous sponsors. Larry. Thank you, Laura. Um, I do want to Second, Laura's uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, the uh, CCAHA annual open house is always a fun event. And uh, unfortunately this year, we can't serve you wine. We can't serve you cheese. There will be no crudite. Um, but the stars are always the conservators and the works of art that, uh, that they have to showcase. So, uh, so it's still gonna be a wonderful event even though it's virtual. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our very generous sponsors. We have five sponsors for uh, the uh, four sessions this week. Our lead sponsor is Atelier Fine Art Services, um, a sponsor for all four, all four evenings. And our sponsor for this evening is Diversified Storage Solutions. 
Um, so, uh, and there are, uh, we have three additional sponsors for, um, for our overall open house, and that's your part-time controller, innovative document imaging, and the Cheshire Law Group. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for your support for this uh, virtual event. And this is a little commercial for our lead sponsor, Atelier Fine Art Services, and I'm going to read a, uh, a script for you. Uh, Atelier FAS Group Fine Art Services is a second generation independently owned full service fine art services company based in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, and currently expanding to Washington DC. Atelier employs over 90 staff in the areas of client services, logistics, operations, art handling, registration, fabrication, storage, and security. Atelier is uniquely qualified and experienced in handling complex installations for art museums, estates, historic houses, and ethnographic and archaeological repositories. Our client services team is composed of former professional museum and gallery registrars who understand the importance of clear documentation and collecting and a collection stewardship. The Atelier team has a strong focus toward expedient project management and working within each individual client's budget and timeline. In addition to a friendly and accessible client services team, Atelier has a crew of highly skilled art handlers and art te technicians who specialize in the areas of packing, installation, transportation, and registration. In 2018, Atelier opened the Atelier FAS Gallery to showcase the vibrant and thriving art scene in Philadelphia. Recognized for its excellence since, since its 1986 inception, Atelier has become a regional stronghold with international status. Atelier works directly with major cultural institutions and prominent private collections, as well as major national and international galleries. Atelier has 150,000 square feet of museum quality storage facilities on the East Coast, one in Philadelphia, the other is in Newcastle, Delaware, with a satellite facility in New York. Atelier has also has 25,000 square feet of fabrication shops for, their, for the custom crafting. Atelier currently has 50 full-time art handlers on staff and 12 art technicians. In addition, Atelier boasts a full fleet of 15 high security, climate controlled air ride vehicles equipped with lift gates. Because of its strong focus on logistics and collections care, Atelier has had the privilege of handling some of the most prominent art relocations packing and installations of the century, including the renowned Barnes Foundation Collection, the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and countless others. And I guess we're gonna turn it over to Scott, Mar uh, Scott Martin from Diversified Storage Solutions. Thank you, Larry. Um, I represent Diversified Storage Solutions, DSS, and we are the local representatives for Space Saver, Viking cabinets, and we provide specialized storage and preservation products along with planning services as shown in, in the following slides. I have a brief slideshow. First three slides I will uh, uh, talk a little bit about, and then after that, you can sort of flip through them uh, to the finish. Uh, you can hit the next slide. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of uh, art storage, art rack storage, and as we all know, 80 to 90 percent of a museum's items are kept in preserved storage areas, and that's where we specialized. Next. Um, current trends in the marketplace include uh, allowing customers to see more and more or uh, clients to come in and see more and more of the materials that uh, are being shown while in storage at the same time. Of course, temperature controlled storage is important, mixed use spaces uh, and uh, orphan collections need to be addressed. Next. Uh, what's, what's being shown here is a, uh, a space with a very tight uh, area. What we did was gutted a building and used full height, 40 foot tall shelving units in a mobile condition to maximize the amount of storage capacity 
within the uh, uh, tight space limitations. And then um, you can flip to the next slides and uh, there's, there's verbiage that gives a, a little more thorough example of, of what we're offering. Next. And you can just spend about three seconds a slide here to finish this out. And while Leah finishes clicking through these beautiful slides, I just want to thank you again, Scott, for DSS support of CCHA and the Open House, to Atelier, and to all of our uh, all of our sponsors tonight. This was made possible because of the, of you and for all of them. So thank you very much. We appreciate you being here and for supporting us. Um, thank you for your. Uh... Uh, bringing us into this and being able to demonstrate our capabilities in the uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware areas. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So now I know what you're all here for is also to see some really interesting objects. So I just want to take a few moments to tell you quickly, very quickly, I promise, about our format for tonight. In order to give you the best view of the collections objects we wanted to share, what will follow are three short recorded segments about each object, each between seven and 10 minutes. After the recorded segments, we'll have live Q&A sessions and hopefully have a really wonderful discussion about the collections profile. So again, as you watch these short videos, please feel free to put your uh, questions in the Q&A. So our first object tonight will be presented by Heather Hendry, CCHA Paper Conservator, Heather, would you briefly introduce yourself and the object um, while we get the video loaded? Hi, um, I'm really excited to talk about this screen today, uh, which that's very much not the video, that's Laura. Um, uh, we've been working on a series of Asian screens here at CCHA and Asian paper conservation is a really specific specialty that you have to train for many years to do full remounts of screens and scrolls. And we would not be prepared to do that. But what we are willing to do and able to do is these local repairs that do not involve completely disassembling and putting the screen back together again. And so this is a new example of a screen that just came into the lab recently and we haven't started treating it but we've been building on this treatment experience. So I'm excited to share it with you. Screen was brought to us by a private client named Jim Ginty. And we've, at CCHA, we've recently had a series of Japanese and Chinese screens that we've been working on. This is a really fun example. And Jim tells us that he found this piece in the flea market and he does not know much about the history. As you can see, there's no signature or chalk mark on it. And so we don't know much about where it came from either, but I believe it is a more modern version of a traditional screen. A traditional Asian screen is built up of many layers. It starts with an interlocking framework of a very light wood underneath in the different panels. And then each panel is covered with many layers of paper that give it the support and strength. And every panel is hinged together with paper as well, which lets it both fold up so it can be displayed standing or be pulled flat so you can hang it onto a wall. When the artist will paint and mount the picture onto it, but then it usually gets a silk brocade trim on the bottom and top as a way of setting off the object. And 
the framing is done to protect the edges, which are the most likely to be damaged. But some of the other vulnerable areas are also the hinges, which are likely to split. And the panels themselves are just made of layers of paper, so they can be damaged quite easily by impact as well. Normally, it would be completely free floating and just attached at the edge here where it wraps around the panel. But there's actually a join right here, which is unusual. It's not something I would have expected, but I think that might be related to why there is a crack here. Is it setting up a little bit of extra tension here because of the join? The other major structural damage is here along the bottom edge. It's split all the way along where it joins. And this is not a surprising place for a split either because this is a join here between a silk brocade fabric and the paper of the painting. And so those two materials react to moisture in a very different way. And I think this is where there's a lot of tension. And so at one point it just cracked and you can actually, this is such a long split, you can see quite a bit inside and you can see that the underlying paper is completely intact. And so this is one of the things that makes mending screens a little more difficult than a normal piece of paper because you can't get at the back to just apply the mend to the back. In this case, I need to come in from the front and get a mend positioned underneath here invisibly and then held together and pulled flat as well. So I'm trying to mend this major crack, but it's much too, um, it's not something I'll be able to get to the back of it because of the paper beneath it. So the technique that we've been using at CCAHA to mend these is to insert these strips behind. Our normal Japanese paper mends are these very, very thin paper strips that are very sympathetic to the paper, are very compatible but strong. But this is so soft that it's very difficult to maneuver in and under here. So we've been using a technique that we got from a Japanese paintings conservation studio in the Netherlands, where we create these mending strips out of layers of Japanese paper. So this is the same very thin, strong paper that's been attached to several more layers of it that are laminated together. But what I have here is an air pocket between the layers. So I'm not attaching a heavy stiff card to the entire thing. I'm only going to attach this very thin layer on the top. But the stiffness behind gives it a way for me to manipulate it from, from the top. So I slide it in under one edge and then I would pull it back and slide it under the other so that it's positioned in the right place underneath. When I put it on, I'm using wheat starch paste, which is a water-based adhesive, and this is what's always been traditionally used on screens. But because of the water, it's going to cause some swelling and tension that I don't want any local pulling here. So what, as soon as I apply the mend, I need to mist the entire area so that this all relaxes with the moisture. And then as it dries, it's using the structure of the screen itself to pull itself flat again. Because the mend is applied wet, it's going to swell up the paper with the moisture. And I want to spread out the tension and let the entire paper swell together and then pull tight together so it flattens all together. This is my favorite new mister. This is a nano mister, which makes a really, really fine mist. It's used for facials in Korean beauty products, but it's been really great for the conservation lab as well. And just to demonstrate what this is doing to a piece of paper, how it will humidify it, and it softens the paper. So you see how malleable this becomes as soon as it's a little moist, but it's not getting actually wet. It's just getting humidified in place. So when I do this to the screen, the paper will soften and then the edges of the screen will pull it tight so that it dries perfectly flat again. This image is on a really lovely thin paper. And one of the special characteristics of Asian paper 
is that it has a really open character to it. It's not flat and really sealed off like a Western paper. So it makes it really, really tempting for a cat to sink its claws into. And that's what happened here on both sides of the join. You see, the cat just went for it and the paper really had no defense. So this will be one of the repair one of the damages that we'll be repairing here. I've just been looking at it today and I believe that the image on this was actually printed and all of the black ink is printed and then it's hand colored. So a lot of the image was here for the artist to color in, but then there were areas that were done as they were working. So little trees like this were put in as the artist worked uh, doing the coloring. Another reason that I think this screen is more modern is it has a lot of little creases inside the paper as it was mounted. And this is so easy to happen because this is a really thin paper that's getting mounted wet. So it creases up really easily, but this is something that a most traditional craftsmen would never accept and would have never let that happen. You can even see up at the top here, you see the brush strokes of the adhesive used, which is really nice. I think it gives you a real sense of how this piece was put together into one object. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that object with us, Heather. And if you have any questions, again, for Heather or more about that screen and the treatment, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will use them um, for the moderated Q&A at the end. So next up, we have senior book conservator, Richard Homer, um, with a very interesting volume. And Richard, can you briefly introduce yourself and the book um, while we get your video ready? Sure, uh, my name is Richard and I'm a, a senior book conservator at the Conservation Center. I've uh, been here about 20 years, um, so I'm starting to feel comfortable. Uh, settling in. And uh, uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the Free Library of Philadelphia for allowing us to uh, talk about their, their book uh, tonight. And, uh, I would also like to um, um, uh, remind you that uh, there is a panelist, Dr. Marianne Simpson, is uh, has been invited tonight. And she is a uh, She's a, an expert in, in manuscript studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, she's been willing to uh, um, come and join us tonight. So if you have any questions about the Quran that is about to be shown, that is not so much a material question, but more of a, a background question, I, I suggest that you you uh, pose pose your questions to um, Dr. Simpson, and she, she would, I, I'm sure, have some sort of an answer for you. So please enjoy. This book comes from the Free Library's uh, bound manuscript collection. They have over 100 Islamic bound manuscripts in their collection, which is much larger than that. Um, it includes a lot of bound material and unbound material, as well as uh, fragments of manuscripts. Um, trem a tremendous resource uh, in our backyard in Philadelphia. And um, this particular volume is um, quite large for a Quran. It, it's probably intended for institutional use, um, not for a personal uh, carry along copy. Um, and this is the first uh, opening, the first two pages, uh, which are often elaborately uh, illustrated or illuminated would be a better term. Um, almost like a carpet, what we would consider to be a, a uh, Persian carpet. This particular book is probably 18th century. There is not a lot of um, clear understanding of its provenance and background. Um, it's potentially Indian in origin. And uh, the, the Free Library is interested in continuing a, a project of digitizing their uh, uh, Islamic manuscript collection. And uh, there, are a few, there are a few cases where the books won't open properly for uh, digitization, or there are um, condition issues that, that would keep that from happening safely. 
In this, in this case, we're dealing with a fairly sound structure. Uh, the leaves are very well attached uh, to each other by process of over sewing, which uh, wraps around each of each of the leaves, and uh, but it also contributes to a, a slight um, grabbing of the leaves and not allowing the book to open completely flat. Um, if you can also see when we open uh, the cover, this is the front cover. This book has been repaired probably in the 20th century, judging by the brown cloth here. This cloth was added to help attach, reattach the boards at some point. Um, and so that, that the stiffness of this cloth is contributing to a restriction in the opening, kind of in a place where it's, it's um, not, not very helpful. So luckily there's a bit of a margin here, a blank margin, and you can capture detail in the margin still. But during treatment, we want to remove that, uh, that cloth. I use a bit of moisture, uh, controlled moisture to soften the adhesives and, and take that off and replace it with something that's more flexible. Uh, originally, most likely the uh, red leather that lines the inside of the boards would have gone over the edge of the board and extended slightly onto these outer leaves. One of the um, fantastic things about this book, and I'll see if I can open to the page here that I'm interested in. As you can see that it, the, the, the rest of the book is, is very textual. Um, and the, uh, the carpet page decoration is not consistent throughout. Um, but you can see these unique elements here, not unique to this book, but they're, they're very striking. There, there are large medallions that indicate um, certain uh, portions of the text, important portions of the text, or they're spaced out in a, in a way that um, uh, corresponds to the structure of the manuscript. They could also be used on occasion for um, signifying when it was appropriate to uh, bow in prayer uh, while reading the text. But what's, what's great about this particular book is the, um, even though the outer shapes of some of these are both trifoil or trefoil, and um, you'll find, you can see the strike through on this particular one is quatrefoil or four, four leafed. Those are fairly standard shapes, but the interior decoration is quite refined and uh, varies from leaf to leaf. Every leaf has, uh, or every page has a uh, decoration like this, at least one. Um, and there are, there are over 400 leaves. I think that's, that's the count on this book. So one of the condition issues that is very important to address is um, if you can see the loss here, there is a, a big old hole right here where um, the paper has been corroded by copper-based media. Uh, the copper the copper media shows up as what we what we often see on copper elements in buildings as verdigris, uh, the the oxidation of copper. And, it, and it's quite acidic and it, it will eat through paper and this paper is particularly thin. So um, it's not used, uh, it doesn't seem to be reacting quite as much in all the places it's used, but in, in certain places where the paper is flexed, uh, it, has, it has contributed to cracking. And then on occasion, uh, luckily the, the element here that fell out has been saved, it's in this piece of paper here. So those are going to be, um, those damaged areas is like a dozen leaves or so that are going to be uh, dealt with um, using very low moisture, if not a um, solvent-based uh, adhesive, uh, just to contribute to not allowing that, the metal components of the ink to, to bleed out and cause uh, a wider uh, problem. Uh, you can also see the cover has a few issues, and uh, here I'll, I'll close the book. 
Now, it's an early, an early binding. Um, to me, it looks more or less late 18th, early 19th century. Um, but it's, it's obvious that the text has been trimmed. There are places where writing has been lopped off. I don't think it's been trimmed significantly. But so the covers on this book are obviously the size of the book after trimming. Also, I mentioned the um, repair. Uh, the spine is not contemporary with the covers. It's a 20th century leather reback. Um, what's, what's interesting about this cover is in, in the tradition of Islamic style bindings, they're often, the decoration is not done directly on the book, but uh, little lozenges of leather are prepared separate from the book, and then they are placed into um, recesses in the, in the leather that's covering the book, the black leather. So that's what we're seeing here. You can see here the abrupt stop of the decoration because this particular piece of leather has popped away and is, is lost somewhere in history. So, um, but a lot of it, a lot of it remains with some minor abrasion. And then we see the flap component here, uh, which has a rigid piece that's about the width of the book or the depth of the book and a very um, flexible piece here, which has um, undergone damage. I believe it's been repaired with a similar leather to the spine at the head and tail. And um, during that process, potentially some of this distortion took place like shrinkage. Um, so that is something we want to address as well. Uh, flatten that out, make it dimensionally stable and reinforce these areas as best we can, um, most likely with um, an acrylic toned mulberry paper rather than leather. So this just fits over like this. And then the, um, the library has a box that it gets stored in. It's a, a heavy thing. The paper is thin, but it's, it's, um, it's coated with starch. It's impregnated with starch. And so it's a very dense, uh, book in terms of all of there's not a lot of air in the in the text so it's it's quite a quite a chunk to pick up um i think that's roughly it there's another mend um along the back corner here um just to to keep this from falling off so we'll just we'll just leave all of those mends in place they're doing a pretty good job actually um and they're fairly strong it's a good quality leather, uh, but we'll, we'll deal with everything that's vulnerable at the moment. And then the patina will be left as it is um, to indicate its age and um, not get in the way of research. Um, there, are, there are elements in the text as well that are, you know, there's scuffs and, and uh, skinning, and those things are, are evidence of use. As long as they're not terribly vulnerable, we'll just let them be. Great. Thank you for sharing that amazing book with us, Richard, and look forward to talking more about it in a little bit. And for our last video of this evening, I'd like to ask Jillian Wilcox, a senior conservation in, a senior conservation assistant, pardon me, uh, to introduce herself quickly and tell us uh, what we are going to see. Jillian. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Jillian Wilcox. I'm a senior conservation assistant here at the lab. And for tonight, one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, materials to treat is parchment. And fortunately at the center, we get a great variety of different formats and, and types from joined 14 foot long parchment scrolls to unique objects such as the wonderful charter I'm about to show you. And I hope you enjoy it. And please, uh, if you have any questions at the end for me, um, be happy to answer them. Um, so I hope you enjoy. Thanks. So Jillian, thanks so much for doing this today. Really appreciate it. What are you sharing with us and, and why is this object important? Um, this evening, I'd like to share a treatment of a wonderful parchment charter. It's a pen charter. It's dated 1680 and it's from King Charles II granting William Penn province in America. 
uh, William Penn petitioned King Charles for land in the New World. And Charles owed Penn's late father uh, a great debt because he used his own wealth at, to outfit and feed the British army. So Penn offered to forgive the debt in exchange for land in America. So King Charles agreed and uh, granted Penn the charter. Apparently, I didn't know this, it was pretty cool, but uh, King Charles insisted on the name Pennsylvania. Penn is for the elder statesman and the Latin word Sylvania means woods, so Penn's woods. One other thing that I think is really, really cool about this, it's just a fascinating bit of trivia, is that I learned that at 36, William Penn was the proprietor of the largest privately owned land in the world at the time, 28 million acres. Very cool. And so this parchment in and of itself, besides being a really important historical document, it looks like it has a really interesting structure to it. Can you tell me a bit more about the object itself um, and some of the condition issues that it had? Um, when we received it, the charter had been folded and probably for most of its 340 years. Unfortunately, this caused for the tight planar distortions uh, in the folds. Um, and that was kind of the, the biggest uh, outright um, problem. Uh, the charter consists of three pages uh, with brown and red manuscript ink and black printing ink. And the black printing ink is only on the design um, on the, the back page. Uh, the pages are attached at the bottom and the bottom of the last page, which is actually the first page of the document, um, um, was folded. The, the, the back page is a longer page and that first page of the document was folded toward the front to collect the top two pages. And this whole document was secured with two porch parchment cords on either end, laced through either end. And also you'll see that there's a white and red uh, braided cord with a wax seal uh, at the bottom, which was also, the cord was also braided through the uh, bottom section of the parchment. And it's lucky to still have so many of the parts of the seal it's it's rare it's a pretty big seal so it's rare to have all the pieces um but unfortunately um we can't really identify the configuration due to the lack of the uh, remaining um, impression the embossing on that uh, on that waxed resin seal so with all these different condition issues that it had and also the fact that it did have so many of the original pieces, like you said, holding it together. Um, what treatment approach did you take um, to address these things? Um, well, the greatest condition issue uh, was the loss and flaking of the inks. And also in the back of the very last page, mm -hmm. along mm -hmm. the printed border and manuscript ink border, uh, the ink was so heavily applied, the manuscript was so heavily applied that the corrosive properties of the ink actually ate through the parchment. So that was, and there's just a few lines, but uh, in the design, um, but that was, was pretty serious issue. Um, but due to the fragility of the inks, uh, the first goal was to um, treat uh, and, and save the inks, what was almost gone and stabilize what was fragile. So these areas were immediately consolidated with a dilute uh, gelatin solution. Um, after that had all been secured and there is a, a good a bit of, uh, of, of um, ink flaking, unfortunately. Um, next was to mend and reinforce the cord. Um, so I used uh, acrylic toned uh, cotton thread and I just um, mended and kind of reinforced the cord because it had gotten very weak and one area was torn. And it also allowed me to better manipulate the whole uh, document because it was fairly large size. 
and I didn't want this delicate cord to have to, you know, keep being moved. So that just stabilized the cord and, and helped in the moving of it. The pages were surface cleaned primarily with a vulcanized rubber sponge, but avoiding all text and all design. And the losses and tears were mended with acrylic toned uh, tissue and dilute gelatin solution. The final step in the treatment was flattening and where we would usually only flatten one sheet, treating three at once uh, became a slightly fun challenge. Um, and where we usually would do the flattening on the suction table, uh, that really wasn't an option. We've, you can always flatten one and sometimes two sheets, but three sheets, you don't, you don't get that pool of suction through. And the, the parchment was a relatively heavy parchment um, so I, I just knew that wasn't going to be an option. Um, and my mantra became slow and gradual because I was thinking of ways of how to get it flat. And I realized the best option was mat board. It's really flat and it would absorb some of the moisture and the humidity from uh, the parchment. So I had to uh, decide to gradually humidify the piece. And my first pressing was between uh, a dense felt. I humidified it again and again, very slowly, constantly peeking at it. And after the second humidification, I press it between mat board, but very gently. After the third humidification um, was the final press. And that was between mat board under a lot of weight. Um, and again, constantly checking the center, the outside, the bottom, the, the fold at the bottom to make sure that was flattening with the same weight as the rest of the three sheets. We always leave the parchment flattening as long as we can. And unfortunately or fortunately, during the pandemic, it had a really, really long time to flatten. And it only benefited from it. It's, it's perfectly flat. It looks beautiful. Well, maybe that's the only plus to come from that's the pandemic. The only, <laughs> only plus to <laughs> certain treatments and conservation. Absolutely. <laughs> this, this parchment was able to, to be able to flatten for so long. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the interesting, other interesting things about this, as you mentioned, the having the three sheets and the treatment challenges it faced, it also seems like that would be a really challenging yet interesting storage or housing issue to have as well thinking about how do you keep this as flat as possible and and um, make sure it's good for the long term so can you tell us about what solutions you came up with with our housing department to store yeah. those parchments yes absolutely um, in cases like this and for this particular piece the client definitely wanted a sealed package and for this it would be the best since you have two sheets that are now flattened like perfectly flat and the treatments on parchment 99 percent of them go into sealed packages um, because of their sensitivity to fluctuations in climate conditions to prepare for this uh the matting of a single sheet of parchment we do intermittent hinges along the perimeter um, and this keeps the parchment under light tension and the sealed package is pretty much airtight. Um, but if, you know, it's just, it's just a way of holding the, the tension of the parchment. If anything should happen, the hinges will give before the parchment. Um, the order of the, the document um, is uh, back to front. So the first page, the main page, is the back page and then the second and then the front page is the third page. And um, for this, and, and what's beautiful about this, uh, the first page, it has this elegant uh, printed border and the it's just exquisite as you can see. And uh, there's exquisite penmanship in the uh, historiated initial uh, of King Charles II, which is the image to the very, uh, to the very left corner. And the client wanted to be able to see this naturally, it's, just, it's the best page. 
And uh, so that's what makes this uh, display format unique um, is that the front two pages were then going to have to be uh, folded to the front to reveal the first page. And I am looking forward to working with SAC to further get dimensional perimeters uh, for the seal package. And this will dictate to me where the fold will need to be and the limit to depth because there's gotta be some limit to the sealed package. Um, so I will definitely be working with Zach on trying to, you know, him giving me like the parameters of just how, how high we can go or how low we have to go. Um, so I would be putting hinges on the perimeter of the first page. And I will also be applying a few hinges to the sides of the top two pages to hold them down as well. They're not gonna need as many because the first sheet is what really needs to be supported. Um, but I believe that Zach might have to use additional uh, polyethylene strips um, as needed to just kind of keep that bow um, stable and, and just keep it closer to the, the mat board. Um, and also as far as the cord and seal, uh, that's going to be left up to Zach's expertise. That's, that's an issue in itself and he's mastered that. So that is just, that's not my subject. That's, <laughs> that's going to be a, a, a little challenge for Zach, but it's going to look beautiful. Uh, I know it's going to look beautiful when it's done and the client hopefully will be very, very happy. Uh, thank you, Jillian, for all your expertise that you put into to working on this parchment. You are yes. at CCHA, <laughs> definitely the are one of our parchment mavens, and um, I know you always appreciate a, a good challenge when it when it comes to a treatment project. So this seems like it absolutely <laughs> gave it to you. So it was fun. It really was fun. I love challenges, yeah. especially when you can really resolve them. It's yeah. always good. Great. Thanks so much, Jillian. I know folks um, might have questions for you about this treatment at the Q&A. So until then, Thank great. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the lecture, everybody. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you all enjoyed learning about these objects as much as I did. And I see that there are some questions in our Q&A section. So now I'd like to ask, uh, Heather, Richard, and Jillian to join us for our Q&A session. And they're also gonna be joined by Dr. Mariana Shreve Simpson, who is the foremost expert, as Richard mentioned earlier in the Quran that was presented. Dr. Simpson is a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania and has published, taught, and lectured widely on medieval and early modern Islamic art in general and in the arts of the book, um, especially Persian illustrated manuscripts. Um, and tonight's Q&A will be moderated by CCHA board member, Steve Miller. Steve uh, is the executive director emeritus at the, of the Morris Museum, and he served in the museum field for over five decades. If you Google his name, you'll see all kinds of great articles that he's, he's written. Um, and we're thrilled to have him as a CCHA board member and with us here tonight. So Steve, I'll turn things over to you. Steve, I think you're muted still. <laughs> okay, how's that? Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Great. You didn't miss, you didn't miss a thing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know that we have a number of outstanding questions uh, from visitors, but I'd like to have Dr. Simpson talk about her thoughts on the Quran. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I saw in the in the Q&A, somebody asked about the provenance of the Quran and its, uh, its history. It's extremely complicated and, and uncertain. The text itself, the holy text of the Quran, was probably copied in the late 18th century in India. I believe that the manuscript may have gone to Iran, which is where most of the illumination, including the opening um, carpet pages that uh, Richard Homer discussed, and the marginal medallions, probably it was then that uh, those uh, aspects of the decoration were added. But I wanted to particularly 
mention something about the cover, which again, uh, Richard Homer brought to our attention. The, the traditional Islamic manuscript binding consists of uh, the top and bottom boards, and the bottom board always has an extension, which is a flap that wraps, wraps around the foredge of the text block to protect, to protect the text block. And the, uh, the manuscript in the free library has, the, has a narrow strip and then a pentagonal strip. And that uh, pentagonal part would have been in a traditional Islamic manuscript would have been would have tucked under the top cover of the manuscript to make a, like a little package, like an enclosure. In the case of the Free Library manuscript, there's an additional rather wide uh, section that's been added, probably in the 19th century, which makes the whole uh, flap end up resting on the top of the cover. And that what's fascinating to me is that you we can see how the um, color of the, the, the tone of the gilding on the top cover is lighter where the flap would have rested on top and it's darker on the outer area that would have been handled. So this is a kind of modification of a traditional Islamic manuscript that would have happened in modern times, probably when the manuscript was brought from uh, either India or Iran to Europe and uh, probably to London, which is where Mr. Lewis, John Frederick Lewis, would have acquired it. Thank you. Uh, now, do we have any other questions? I see we have about eight out there and uh, I'd like to hear from everybody. What's up? Well, I think Steve, um, folks won't be able to unmute themselves. So you'll need to pick your questions and, and read them to the panelists. Okay. Um, Here's our first question comes from uh, Bonnie uh, Cochard and who says, how do you choose which projects to take on? What are the criteria? Is there a waiting list of projects to be done? Laura. <laughs> well, I'll actually leave that to, I'll throw that one to you, Heather, um, to talk about you know, what our process is for, for working with folks and um, how, how they might approach you. Uh, when a client approaches us, and we work with both private and institutional clients all the time, uh, we usually find out a little bit about their object. And if it's within our range, we will definitely work on it, uh, whatever you might have. So our core competencies are paper, book, and photo. And I think the things that we've been showing today are all items that are exciting to us because we stretched a little bit and we're doing something that's a little bit more unusual and we had to learn a little bit as we did it. But if there was something that was just too far out of what we normally do, if you came in with a canvas painting, we would refer you to a professional that could help you with that. Uh, when a client comes in, we meet with them and look at their objects and talk about their goals for the treatment and also their plans for storage or exhibition in the future so that we can also offer the housing that was, for example, such a big part of Jillian's project. And right now we do have a bit of a backlog, especially for framing things, but we generally have between a three to six or nine month turnaround, depending on how complex the project is. Thank you very much. I like to say that there's real time, which goes by the clock, and there's museum time, which goes by committees and budgets, and <laughs> conservation time, which can be glacial, but it's well worth the effort. Uh, the, um, Mackenzie Warren had a question that, that Dr. Simpson has asked, answered, I believe. What's the provenance of the Quran? How did the library come to have it? The Quran is part of the John Frederick Lewis collection, which came to um, the library in, uh, let me see if I remember, the late 1920s as a bequest. And Mr. Lewis had been collecting Islamic and Western medieval manuscripts for decades and bequeathed his collection to the Free Library. Uh, so some um, 1933, Caitlin, Caitlin uh, Goodman from the Free Library is reminding us now. So it was a gift uh, from actually Mr. Lewis's uh, widow. 
Uh, so the things have been in the library for quite a while, and there's some of, and now that they're all being digitized, and thanks to Richard Homer's work, this large Quran finally can be digitized. We'll we'll get to learn a lot more about the manuscripts. That's terrific. Uh, Bonnie has another question: Who are the owners of the charter, and what do they want to do with it once it's restored? Julian. Uh, the charter is privately owned, and they're going to be putting it into a um, sealed package. I mean, I described somewhat of the housing, but I, I didn't say it was going to be going into a sealed package. And unlike a normal framing, the sealed package will protect it, um, protect it um, from um, fluctuating humidity, temperature, uh, dust, um, and uh, I'm... I'm not sure where they're going to house it, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's really going to be beautiful, but it's going to be in a format, a housing format that will protect it better than, than anything. Great. I think it's important to remind everybody that the center not only works with organizations and institutions, but with private owners and individuals. Uh, Bonnie has another question. How long will it take you to complete each of these projects? Anybody? Well, I can start and say, and hopefully you can hear me this time. Um, if, if anyone, uh, my my deep voice is sometimes lost in the uh, in the ether. Um, uh, for the for the Quran, I believe it's a a forty a forty hour project, more or less. Um, but of course, that won't be a two week or a one week turnaround time that's uh extends itself as we um weave it in with other with other projects and also um you know take our time to think through what we're doing um but yeah that's about that's about the scale of what we're looking at for that project because that's always a, that's a very good question when you bring in work to be worked on how do you figure out how long it's going to take there are a lot of unknowns along the way uh, for for books, I think we have a kind of over the years kind of uh, reflected back on what actual versus estimate looks like, and uh, um, there are certain certain things that are pretty standard and and don't wiggle too much. Um, one of the the main fluctuations is uh, a book has a number of pages, and there's a lot of variety in terms of how many tears could be on those pages, and a lot of a lot of time goes into uh, the tedious work of repairing tears in, in pages. So um, uh, I have a system for figuring out uh, per tear uh, how many hours that <laughs> that will actually take, um, and sometimes you just have to guess because you don't have the liberty to 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 sit there and page through and look at all all of the leaves but um do, yeah that's do, do clients say hurry up yeah, yeah we have a range of, of patients that we're dealing with yeah uh an understanding so uh bonnie has another question this is about the charter also why are the pages in reverse i'm not really sure i don't know if richard uh might know this answer um but we've gotten, we've had several that have been in reverse. Um, I'm not sure if it's just, surprisingly, the format of the presentation, um, the first page first, but unfortunately, but the second and the third go in front of it, or sometimes there's even four. Um, I, I don't know, it's a good question. Uh, I think it's because the signatures are the most important thing and they are generally on the last page. And so the last page is on the top. Um, Interesting. that's my theory anyway. You're always right. So I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Will the parchment be permanently displayed in its sealed package? Yes. That's okay. the purpose of a sealed package is, is to store it or to display it yeah, um, that, in that it's, it's the best way to preserve it. Yeah. That question was from Anna Crane. Sorry. Uh, Susan, uh, Blakeney said, what an amazing parchment framing challenge. Thanks so much for sharing. I have ideas. Susan B-L-A-K-N-E-Y is in 
Skinny Atlas, which is spelled S-K-A-N-E-A-T-L-E-S. -E -E uh, Jason Downs, to any and all presenters, on any given project, are you typically relying on your tried and true toolbox of techniques, or do you, do you feel like you are constantly forced to innovate? Well, for the parchment, um, being that uh, in the final stage of flattening, this is when we always love challenges because we always learn from challenges. But in that case, it's like I couldn't put it on the suction table and you have to come up with other ways that will safely achieve the same effect. And in this case, it was the, the mat board. Um, yeah, you, you really, each piece is always unique. And that's how I, you know, conservators learn. They just learn from each object. And the more challenging, uh, the more fun I find it. Especially when it's it's easy to achieve that 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 goal. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how you learn. <laughs> well, I think Heather was mentioning uh, learning and new tricks. You know. <laughs> Uh, Jason, uh, or not Jason, uh, Sarah Grabner has a similar question about how long did these projects take or are estimated to take? Have any of them been completed yet? I guess not. Um, I'm almost done. Yeah. So Mackenzie Warren uh, said, what would happen to the screen if the tears were not repaired? Would the damage become irreparable? Uh, I don't think it would ever become irreparable unless we were to lose sections of the screen, which can happen in any object that has bad tears. A fragment can become separated and then that part's gone forever. But um, we can continue to repair. And if the tears were really to get to a certain stage, that might also be the time for an Asian conservator to come in and completely remount the screen instead of just repairing tears locally, which is what we can do. Well, I have a about the screen, um, you said it's a, a modern work and you were talking about part of the imagery is, is printed and painted on top of that. Do you have any sense of the, of the approximate time this was done or the date or the era or the decade? It's a fun mystery, which happens when items come from private collections. And like I said in the video, um, the owner found this in the flea market, so he doesn't really know either. And I can't say based on my examination that I have any sense of when this was made either. Um, I think it's more recent because it is more mass produced, but I can't really say when. And how many, have you worked on other screens before? Yeah, this is actually the third one in three years. So we've been building this expertise. And one of the fun things is we have a new fellow every year who's a conservator just starting out. And so every year we've been able to get give the fellow that we have that year a chance to work on this project, which is a little unusual and they can learn on it as well. That's terrific. That sets me up for the question from Caroline Kennedy. Uh, did you work with student interns on these projects? And if so, how did they help? I wanna to speak to that actually, because what started us on the path to being able to treat these screens in the first place was an intern who we had who was finishing up her paper conservation training. She was from the Netherlands, Juliet, and she was doing an internship with us and had previously done an internship in an actual Japanese conservation studio. And so she knew of this technique and she was able to speak to her mentors uh, to get more information about it. And she created the proposal based on their advice and then actually completed her internship before we had approval to do the treatment. So another fellow actually got to do the treatment based on her instructions. Well, I also think that Jason would like to answer this question live. Jason, you're out there, you wanna jump in? Okay, I have a question about the Quran. 
Um, were there any particular cultural sensitivities that you had to have in handling this? Um, that wasn't discussed with the, uh, the curator. Um, my understanding of Islam is that it, it is a holy book. Um, and I, I would be careful not to use um, things like uh, pork related uh, materials in, in um, either adhesives or skin. Um, but it's a question that definitely with, with regard to uh, religious texts, uh, it's, it's mostly up to the owner to, to communicate that. Um, and uh, we want to have that discussion ahead of time. Um, but with, a, with an institution, usually these things are, are um, oriented towards research. And um, there's, it, it would be different if, I was, if we were treating something from a, a synagogue or a, or a, um, a church or a, a mosque uh, directly. Um, that was being used consistently for religious pur purposes. How are we doing on time, Laura? I was just going to say, I hate to interrupt, but we are already over time. It goes so quickly and we have such great questions, but I didn't know if you had one more wrap-up question, Steve, that you wanted to ask. Um, the um, I love conservation. I, I've never been a conservator or, or wanted to be, but it really is that wonderful crossroad between science and art and manual dexterity. Um, I mean, you know, you can't be a klutz and be a conservator. So I was wondering if somebody is interested in getting in, becoming a conservator, what do they do? Anybody? Um, I think there's different paths you can take. So typically at this point for, to become a paper conservator, you would, need a master's degree from a recognized program. And there's a small number of programs in North America. In order just to be accepted into those programs, you need a certain base of a combination of art history, chemistry, and fine arts classes to support your application, as well as hopefully some exposure to it. Following your degree, you generally do some fellowships to study with more experienced conservators as well. That's typical for a paper conservator, but for books, I'm gonna let Richard talk about this, but it can be quite different. Well, you bring up an interesting point. And again, I don't wanna take up everybody's time, but this is such an incredible subject and the center is so fantastic. There are various kinds of conservation. I mean, you know, there's object conservation, paper conservation, painting conservation, and now there's digital conservation. Um, you know, it's a, it, there's a lot of stuff out there that needs to be preserved, but it's a very small field. Yeah, I just I wanted to add to what Heather said. It is a little, a little different for books, although there is uh, definitely a way to get a master's and, um, and have a, have a focus on a on book conservation. Uh, generally, you would have a, a fairly uh, broad understanding of paper conservation because books are are mainly made up of um, paper components. Um, but there is a there is a certain amount of uh, bookbinding craft and understanding of historical bookbinding structures that um, require a, a more three dimensional understanding and a functional understanding of of how a book is actually picked up. And handled um, very, very differently than most works of art would be picked up, you know, would not be picked up and handled. Um, so there are there are different different differences in uh, the approach uh, to book conservation. And as you mentioned, Stephen, the, uh, I mean, architectural conservation is a completely different scale. Yeah. And uh, you know, you're you're talking about very varying. Um, skill skill sets that have to to be uh acquired before you even uh move into those categories to some degree you have to have some skills um ahead of time so laura where are we okay well i think that is a perfect note to end on the the all the skills that it takes to go into this work that we saw today that it is not um 
something that even after school, there's a great deal of training, as Heather mentioned, our fellows that get to join us at CCHA, where they learn so much while they're with us, but we also learn so much from them as well. So it's always a pleasure when we can have those postgraduate fellows with us. And you'll actually, it's a great segue for me because what our fellow this year is actually presenting at tomorrow's open house evening. Perfect. Perfect. Um, <laughs> So thank you, Steve, for moderating. Thank you, Dr. Simpson, for being here for the Q&A. Um, Heather, Richard, and Jillian for all your wonderful conversations. And I know we could have gone on much, much longer than we have already. Um, and if you join everybody who has attended, if you enjoyed this evening, please consider joining us again tomorrow night at the same time. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be profiling letters from Mahatma Gandhi a collection of materials from the Edward Hopper House Museum and Study Center, and a very early painting by artist Greg Silvis. And you can use the same Perfect. link that you used tonight um, in order to join us tomorrow. And again, thank you to our sponsors who made the event possible, Atelier Fine Art Services, Diversified Storage Solutions, Cheshire Law Group, Innovative Document Imaging, and your part-time controller. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for joining us and staying a little bit longer than we had intended, but that's all great. And um, I hope we get to see you tomorrow evening as well. So thank you so much. Thank you.